Julius. Puts up a three. Yes! And a goal! Bearcat Blitz time on the Believe Network. A lot of stuff to get to on this show. Thank you all for checking us out on all the kinds of platforms. Podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast, you can check out the show there. And, of course, on Talking Cats with Russ Heltman. Full shows available there. Full interviews. Scott Satterfield interviews from his press conferences during this spring practice time. Just uh, po- posted a shorter interview with Evan Pryor from the Bengals practice facility just uh, just during this week in the final kind of back half of spring practice as the Bearcats start winding things down and get ready for the spring game next week. We'll highlight the spring game and probably take a deeper dive into that on the late week, late episode. I, I got to find a better way to, to phrase these later in the week shows, but the second show of the week next week, we will dive into the spring game in full force, but it's portal season right now. As I get ready to welcome in my co-host, Neil Meyer. I'm of course your host, Russ Eltman. We are both with BearcatsTalk.com. You can check Neil out on frontofficenews.com as well. A lot of, a lot of news coming through those two sites in recent days as Cincinnati says, likely says goodbye. Once you enter the portal, it's not a guaranteed fact you're going to leave, but they're, they're saying goodbye to Victor Locke and, and, uh, in, in all technical terms and definitely saying goodbye to Jamil Reynolds, who committed to South Florida very quickly once he entered the portal. We'll touch on that today, plus get to the latest portal contacts. As you see, it's going to definitely start expanding from just a guard interest pool to a guard and big man interest pool as well, with only Aziz Bandego and Sage Tolentino as scholarship bigs on the roster right now. And we will also look at the new CFB model, the new college football model reported by the athletic Stuart Mandel and Bruce Feldman, or excuse me, the athletic Stuart Mandel and Andrew Marshand. And we'll see uh, just what that entails and what Neil and I think about it as something's got to change in the college sports landscape to make it sustainable and just get rid of some of these NIL tampering issues. I mean, Jamil Reynolds, a perfect example right there. He he goes in the transfer portal and is committed to USF less than six hours later. Like the, the, that came together very, very quickly. And it's just something that these coaches can't, They can't control. You can't control what other coaches are talking to which players. It's really hard to govern this if you're the NCAA because you don't really have a leg to stand on, especially in the sport of college football. So we'll dive into all that in today's show. But first, I want to tell you about Bet Online. It's down to the last four teams. Bet Online has been your tournament bracket headquarters all March long. And now that we're almost down to the finals, we've still got a lot more in store. MLB is here, and NBA NHL playoffs are right around the corner. As always, Bet Online is the number one source for your summer sports wagering. Head to Bet Online today to stay updated on all the action. And remember to use promo code BELIEVE. It's B L E A V for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit bet online the game starts here neil we look pretty smart talking about the names we discuss potentially entering the transfer portal just decisions to be made with the future of two guys in particular that wasted not much time after we posted on monday to go into the portal victor Locken still looking for a home but he is in the transfer portal right now and jamil reynolds as i mentioned Headed to South Florida. Sounds like Jamil and the Reynolds family want to wish them all the best. Sounds like they're dealing with some some things that they want to in, ensuingly get Jamil closer to home. He's a St. Petersburg native. So wish Jamil all the best headed back to the AAC as he goes from uh, Temple to UCF to Cincinnati down to South Florida to continue his career. Neil, the floor is yours, my man. Those two guys exit the program and leave a gaping hole behind Aziz Bandago in the Bearcats front court rotation. Yeah. And it, it's something we have to talk about, Russ. I mean, it is a gaping hole and it's, you can't even put any emphasis on that term gaping hole. Cause there is right now, no depth behind the Z's Bandago Sage Tolentino holds the scholarship, but he's still yet to see significant minutes. I mean, he redshirted his freshman season this season. He only appeared in limited action. So right now we're talking about it, Russ, what could be, that front court, if you were able to contain Jamil Reynolds and Aziz Bandego for a second year in Clifton. But now you're looking at the different things. Jamil Reynolds obviously going down to USF. 
to be closer to home to deal with what sounds like some personal issues with his family. So we do want to wish the, uh, Jamil and his family the best, but Victor Lock in the start there. Russ, I think we, we all kind of saw this one coming and yeah. it was, it, it was sad to see, especially throughout the later half of the season. I mean, fans did him wrong in my opinion by booing him throughout the season. I mean, this was a guy who stuck with Cincinnati through a pandemic a coaching change. He had to learn a new language. I think people will forget about that as well. And I mean, this is a guy who was the definition of a Bearcat, Russ. And I know you and I have had some great, some great moments with Victor Locke and covering this team and covering Vic. One that stands out to mind was last year's comment, Russ. I think you, you know what we're talking about, the interaction where he was talking about former GA Jalen Stowe. That's the first one that comes to my <laughs> mind. Funny moment where Backstory on it, Jalen Still was giving Vic absolute buckets the day before in practice. Vic comes out, puts up a 20-point performance, and he just goes, man, I hate you, so I I hate you. That was the moment right there. Like, you saw his character come out, his personality started getting comfortable. But, man, Vic, Vic was awesome. He was always engaging the people. But it's sad to see him go. And, I mean, right now I can tell you, Russ, that he will be playing in the in the states next season. I know there was a lot of people saying he was probably going overseas. I can tell you right now, confirm that he will take advantage of his two years of eligibility left and will probably be in the states playing at probably another Power Five conference. I mean, look at the numbers he's put up. He will be playing somewhere. He's going to be getting good interest in the portal, and we will see Victor Locke in continuing his career somewhere at the Division One level throughout this upcoming season, but it, it does suck to see him go. Russ, it truly does. But Jamil Reynolds, I mean, it's, it's not really a surprise to say the least. Yeah. We saw how he puts the frustrations on Twitter or X, whatever some people may call it now, especially after the Indiana state game and some now quickly deleted posts. But we saw that we kind of saw what could come. He was obviously voiced some frustrations, but we saw glimpses and flashes of what Jamil Reynolds could do. But, Overall, he was was not able to fully put it together. Obviously, he still had to come over through the waiver process and whatnot, but it does kind of suck, Russ. We were talking about this on our podcast with Alex and Alex Meacham and JT Smith, uh, the tip-off talk podcast, but Wes Miller and them fought tremendously hard to get Jamil Reynolds eligible to be in this situation to where he was able to see the court this season. And let's be honest, there was a lot of coaches in college basketball who did not do that for these young yeah. athletes. So Wes and, he, Miller, and he stood, he stamped the floor when I would even ask some tough questions of West, like what's going on with Jamil? What do you think? Like he would, they constantly, they never back down mm -hmm. from standing behind Jamil Reynolds. And that, that is commendable for sure. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think you see that kind of effort come from many college coaches across the college basketball, especially in this weird landscape of the two time transfer rule, whatever, but Cincinnati did whatever they could to get Jamil Reynolds on the court this season and it does suck to see him go because man imagine him Russ with a full off season with coach Rayfeld arguably one of the best strength coaches in the country back in the monster factory I mean we saw glimpses of it but man I thought one more year with him in the monster factory it could have been a a very dangerous sight for Cincinnati in the front court coulda shoulda woulda it's just I, I kind of blame I'm gonna blame the NCAA here I'm not gonna blame Jamil Reynolds I'm not gonna blame the Bearcats I'm not gonna blame the Bearcats staff the fact that they jerked this kid around jerked this guy's future around kept him in limbo for the entire first two months of the season he should have just played hindsight 2020 looking back on it because they ended up just opening the floodgates for everybody right now like everybody can transfer right now it doesn't matter if you're yeah you a don't need time transfer nothing. it's free right, reign right. Right. Jamil is going to be a four-time transfer now. He can do it freely. He does not have to go and get any kind of A-OK -okay from the NCAA when they had that rule in place for one offseason, and it screws up this situation on top of just so many other situations that were similar to Jamil Reynolds. He doesn't get to really get engaged in the games throughout non-conference, and then you are just trying to thread him in there with three or four non-conference games left you're going into the toughest conference in america you can't really get any any structure or any consistency there out of jamil and it's it's just something i'm not going to blame the staff i'm not going to blame jamil it's just a brutal situation it was a rough situation roughly timed transfer roughly timed rule change and rule ap application and it's just 
What are you going to do? You just wish him the best, no doubt about it. Jamil was in his few times speaking with the media. He just was always cool with us, always chill, nice, quiet, soft-spoken guy. But it just the, the timeline just never really worked out for Jamil here in Cincinnati. And like you mentioned, Neil, what could have been had he just known the entire offseason last year he could play, known the whole time, played yeah. the entire non-conference, gotten the full workload in in terms of just you're a normal player in the monster factory. You're a normal player on the roster, in the rotation. And you just never got that opportunity. It's really unfortunate. It's really frustrating to me as a guy that I don't I don't root for the Bearcats, but I root for these players because I like them as people. I, I really hope they, they can succeed. And in the end, these guys are just trying to find their way in the world. They're just trying to, to create better futures for themselves and their families. And that's what the kind of NIL has bottom lined out to of people who get all upset about people going for more money and all this stuff. That's exactly what coaches do as well. That's exactly what we're all doing in this world. We're all trying to get more money. We're all trying to get a better future for ourselves. And so to kind of wrap it up there, commend jail for, you know, not being afraid to go back home, not being afraid to take one more chance and say, Hey, this is what's best for me. It had to have been a tough decision. I'm sure. Because as you mentioned, Neil, like this coaching staff, they embraced him. They stood behind him. They stood behind him through the entire season. And I'm sure they were ready to help kind of elevate him to a whole nother level this off season. It's just sometimes not meant to be like we mentioned on Monday's show, not everybody can hit their potential in the sport of college basketball and the sport of college football. There's only 22 starters in football for a reason. There's only five starters, five players on the court at a time in college basketball. And you do need to have 13 guys on scholarship to maintain a healthy level of depth. It's just a give and take. And unfortunately, Vic Blocken and Jamil Reynolds likely taken away with Vic, just as Neil mentioned, getting power conference interest. They're going to be away from Cincinnati in 24-25 and closing their Cincinnati careers there. We'll close out this segment with just, you know what? My favorite memory, I didn't, we didn't, just didn't get a lot of time with Jamil. So I would, I, I mean, my favorite memory of Jamil was just anytime he would go like airborne for a, for a putback dunk or just an aerial show, like it, there was a lot of mass, a lot of man moving think, through the air. I and think he was a lot one, of fun Ross, throwing down those jams. The one game where he him? caught that, that caught that ball. What was it like eight inches under, under the rim on the putback and then just yeah. came up and windmilled it. I think that's the one that, that stands out. If you're talking airborne with Jamil, but overall, I mean, there's a lot of good memories from both of them. Jamil in his short time had quite a few great memories, but man, Vic, Vic Lockin was the true definition of a bear cat. And I think people need to know and realize that. And I, well. and, and it, I'm with you, Neil, in that it's just, it disgusted me when people booed him during this season with no context about what's going on. The dude's going through an injury. He's going through a sickness as well. It's just all kind of collapsing on him at once in that little two week window in the conference slate. And it just is completely unwarranted. Like the guy built this culture. He was a cornerstone of the culture that Wes Miller has instilled in that building he, in Fifth Third Arena. Only, the only guy that stayed oh, off of John Brandon's roster. Exactly. He He's the only guy who stayed consistently through a pandemic, as you mentioned, through a traveling overseas. Like, he could have left and gone to a place that was more conducive for European transfers. He could have gone to a place that had had – Multiple players from Russia had multiple Eastern Europeans on it or something like that. But no, could have gone back he wanted to learn well. English. Yeah, he could have played in Russia and gotten paid professionally there. But no, he wanted to be in America. He wanted to get his education and he wanted to embrace Cincinnati through and through, which he did. He was at a ton of different games, a ton of different non-basketball events. Neil, Neil, he was at the TBT win. Uh, yeah, the TBT uh, win, that video was uh, crazy. Uh, Vic was, when Vic was standing up there, I can't remember who posted it, but man, Vic was locked in during the right. TBT run. With and no yeah, cameras on him, he didn't. He didn't no have any idea the videos were on man. him. It's just man, that, that was an incredible sight. So Vic, if he ever hears this, he knows how we feel about him. But just commend, commendable, commendable guy, commendable career at UC was the leading scorer on this team up until he hit that rough patch this season. Looked really good in non-conference and just kind of sputtered out in conference play. But overall, Vic. Lockin defines what a Bearcat is. He gutted through it. He gritted through the tough, tough years to get to a pretty successful campaign for Cincinnati in 23-24. And a guy that, like, just the culture, culture building is what Victor Lockin stood for. And my favorite memory of Vic was the the Maui hat. When he came into the press conference oh, off of Maui, 
that was my favorite by far. And he just the advertising to the finest too, because if people rewatch that video, he came in, he put the hat on, he put the sunglasses on, and then he put the uh the Maui sunglasses thing right there too. Yeah. Oh, it was perfect advertisement. Perfect so advertising. Perfect. But perfect we're talking good memories. And, uh, good yeah, memories go ahead, with Nick Russ. We cannot forget the ski yi from this year. That was yeah, that the was ski yi in the conference. He was like that was crazy. Every time I hear that song, I will think of Victor Locker for the rest Vic, of my every life. Every time. Oh man, love it. We could go down memory lane for for hours here on on Bearcat Blitz, but we got to cut this segment right here and get to the transfer portal late transfer portal latest ping in the portal and seeing what uc contacts are surfacing as of this recording on thursday april 4th right here on bearcat blitz presented by bet online all righty neil the bigs have not yet quite surfaced on the reported interests out of the portal. Obviously, things happening very quickly. Both of those portal entries going down on, what, Tuesday morning and then Wednesday afternoon-ish for Vic First and then Jamil Reynolds, who is now going to be playing in South Florida. So we confirmed that. He posted that late Sat or late Tuesday. Excuse me, late Wednesday night. I'm getting all my days wrong here. But we got some portal contacts to get to here the latest in the portal we can kind of touch on these here out of the past couple of days tony perkins contacted by uc neil but he did not have them in his top six uh that on three reported either yesterday on wednesday or early thursday morning so he's kind of off the board which is unfortunate because perkins i mean it would have been an absolutely home absolute home run option at six foot four to replace john newman as your kind of defensive stalwart guard wing there in the starting lineup a guy i'm really interested in neil miak player of the year jamari thomas reached out to by cincinnati average 16.9 points 3.8 rebounds and 3.8 assists one year of eligibility left for thomas he could be a very interesting option xavier to sell i'm very interested in him as well fresno state guard big guy six foot four can guard similar type of profiles that john newman was able to pick up last year 11.5 points 42.3% shooting overall, so not great there, but 39.5% from outside, 2.1 rebounds out of DeSell. Zeke Mayo, they contacted him, Neil, and then, of course, Kansas swoops in and gets one of the best one of the best transfer targets in the entire country. Zeke Mayo would have been a nasty addition for UC. Average 8.8 points, 5.7 rebounds, and 3.5 assists at six foot four. but... Obviously, we don't need to talk about him anymore because the former South Dakota State Jackrabbit is headed to Kansas. A guy I'm also very interested in, and on top of Ducell, this is probably my number one kind of realistic candidate that the Bearcats could maybe pull out of this portal. Cody Head, freshman out of Lipscomb, averaged 8.1 points, 2.1 rebounds, only played 18 minutes per game, so that's pretty good numbers right there if you bear it out to 36 minutes per game. Uh, the uh, the per 36 numbers 53 percent overall neil from the floor 35 percent from deep has three years of eligibility left obviously six foot three talent so can guard some of those taller players and then we get to north texas sophomore guard jason edwards six foot tall fill it up bucket getter 35 percent from deep 42 percent from uh shooting outside 42 percent shooting all season to amass 19.1 points per game. First team, all AAC after playing just one Division One season so far, coming over from the JUCO level. And that kind of rounds out the latest in the portal contacts. And it does look like just before our recording this morning, Neil, we had Derek Butler, Central Michigan guard, six foot two, 195 pounds. He has been linked by Portal Report to the Cincinnati Bearcats. And Derek Butler possible target there out of the Mac all guards Neil and just early interest so far but I kind of I'm liking these profiles that they're going after it's going to be interesting to see which guy they ultimately land on and also I don't know if we talked about it on the last show but Connor Hickman their opponent in the NIT could they do this again where they face a player in the NIT who did very well against them and bring them over a la Aziz Mandego out of Utah Valley last year Connor Hickman out of Bradley has been t- been contacted by Cincinnati and is uh, is a guy that is on their radar as well. Six foot three, two hundred pounds. Obviously, can fill it up from outside and is a good jump shooter 
at his size. Interesting names, Neil, and I'm sure we're going to be getting there. Be, there will be another ping of the portal for me in the next day or so because the big fellows are going to start flowing in here by the time we record again on Monday. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, right now, Russ, I mean, you can see what kind of caliber players and what position they were really targeting throughout this early portion of the transfer portal. And that was a point guard, combo guard, scoring guard. But I don't think people really, I think the entry of Jamil Reynolds into the portal was kind of like 50, 50, but now that he is in the portal, you expect to see Cincinnati target another big, obviously for depth yeah. there in the front court. Expect to see that one. I think it's a guarantee that they're they will probably contact a couple of bigs and maybe get a commitment from maybe one, maybe two of them. You never know how the transfer portal works, but I definitely expect you're probably going to need unless they anticipate you're need Tolentino one for depth in the Big Twelve. Yeah, right. Unless they anticipate Tolentino blossoming in this third year with the the program. And, and being one of those rotation depth pieces, you're going to have to get a guy similar to Odi Guama that can play those kind of minutes and, and back up Aziz and the other big that's going to be the major part of the rotation alongside, alongside Bandega. Yeah, so I, I fully expect them to be active in that market as well outside of a combo scoring guard. But I I think it's just it, it has to happen, Russ. I think you got to get some depth there and it there in the front court because we saw it last season, even with the depth that they had last season, Aziz Bandego gets banged up, gets banged up while Jamil Reynolds is still fighting the, the legal issues with the two-time waiver process. Aziz is out for a month. Vic gets banged up. Millie gets still finding his foot in, footing earlier in the season. Like despite even having all the, the depth there last season, they were never able to fully get a full, full workload in together. It seemed like because Aziz was hurt. Vic went down with an injury, like still trying to find its footing. So I definitely think Russ, I, I know for a fact, we'll probably see a bunch of names start flowing at that power forward or that center position to leave some pressure off of a guy like Aziz Bandego. Cause he's, he's going to need some, going to need another big man in there in the paint to complement his game. Obviously we know what he's able to do on the defensive end, but Offensive end, we're going to need a, a scoring big, pound the ball inside, and I think I think that's going to be a guy that they'll expect to target or a caliber player that they should be able to go in the portal, make good contact with, and hopefully land one of those ca- high-scoring caliber bigs. Yeah, we shall see. And another note with the entry of Jamil Reynolds, Neil, I think it might end up kind of l- – I would be a little surprised, say it this way, I would be a little surprised now if Tyler McKinley doesn't become a rotational part of this team, like at least right like bat, eight yep. to 10 minutes a game. Like it doesn't seem like he's a he's even close to a redshirt candidate with how many open spots they have, how productive he's been in high school, how highly ranked he is, how productive he's been in the summer, how close he's been to the program. Like he's going to be in there working out with all them throughout this summer, most likely you'd think, because he's just been around and he's in town already. So – might be a kind of boon for Tyler McKinley, getting his development, cooking a little bit earlier, getting his feet wet a little bit earlier as a Bearcat. Obviously, I mean, he's the only he is the only power forward on the roster right now, Neil. Tyler McKinley, he's the only one. They don't have any other power forwards. A Sage Tolentino, seven footer alongside Aziz Bandago. And let's look at that roster right now. When you think about it, we are recording this on Thursday, April 4th. Cincinnati's now been done, Neil. For what a week? We're coming up yeah, on a week. a week, and no word yet on CJ Frederick, a player who has also been sharing NIL since he reigns posts. So that tells me, Neil, that it's not necessarily a, a shoe in that CJ Frederick's going to end his career after this frustrating, another frustrating season of injury. Maybe he's coming back for one more run, and it's possible that he could be a part of this, this program moving forward. I mean, he is, he is a part of the roster as of right now. He is, he is part of the team heading into 24, 25. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if he decides to come back and return next season, Russ, I mean, look at what you get on the wing. CMOS Lukosius, Russ, I know me and you talked about this personally. CMOS Lukosius has a case to where he could be a top 10 field goal percentage shooter in all of college basketball next season. You could you could argue he was the best three-point shooter with all the numbers together, NIT included, in the Big 12 last year. He was second yep. in three-point um, 
in three point percentage, and he was fifth in total threes attempted. So that I mean, I don't think there was anybody else in the in the top five of, of both categories. So that's that's pretty pretty impressive. And we didn't mention that Neil that Simas Lukosius has confirmed that he will be a part of the team next year. So yeah, sorry, continue. Yeah, and then you pair that alongside a potential return of C.J. Frederick. I mean, you have two pure shooters on the on the wing, and C.J. Frederick. I mean, if we can get him back fully healthy, get him to shooting like he shot back at Iowa or Kentucky, even when he was healthy. We saw it at the beginning of the season, Ross. We truly did. And then next thing you know, it's, oh, you're adding two high-caliber wing players in C.J. Frederick and Seamus Lukosius. I mean, it could get dangerous Then the development of Dan Skillings. I mean, it could jizzle James as well. I mean, there's a lot of things that could play out in Cincinnati's favor heading into next season. But, man, if C.J. Frederick decides to return, Ross, it could get real interesting at that wing position. It really could. No, it's just he was – an elite offensive player when he was on the floor. He was he had one of the best net ratings of anybody on the team, key words, when he was on the floor. And that's the big hang-up here. Does this staff and the medical staff, led by Mob Man Gene specifically, are they confident enough that that hamstring can hold up, that his body can hold up over a full season, that he can be – because if it, if they're if they have enough confidence there, then yes, he's a thousand percent. You keep him on the roster, you keep him on the team. You want to have him there as one of the best shooters in the country throughout his entire career. It's just it's like Zion Williamson in the NBA. It's like the, the asset is so amazing when they're actually out there on the floor. But the best ability is availability, and CJ Frederick has just not been available very much in his college career lately. We'll see what happens there over the next few days. We're going to see what happens over the next few years with the future of college football and in down the line, college sports as we know it. Neil and I touching on the cool proposal from Scholar, or it's it's a interesting college sports today is what the uh, the group is called. And we will dive into that in just a few moments here on Bearcat Blitz. <laughs> Back at Blitz, closing out here with a quick segment to close the show. Just batting around the, I said college sports today. It's college sports tomorrow, which is this new group headed up by number two NFL executive Brian Rolap and Philadelphia 76ers owner David Blitzer. They're not necessarily leading the charge, but they're part of the 20 names in this group that are trying to reshape what college football looks like, take it out of the traditional conference system, Neil, and take all yes. our conference schools, including AAC, new AAC entry, SMU, and Notre Dame. They would be put in their own divisions, their own kind of conferences, so to speak. It would be like a Big East, a Big Ten. Uh, they would just name it whatever they want to name it. And it would be 10 schools in each pod grouped by region, so that would make up the top 70 schools. And then there would be a 10th set of teams that would mix into these regions as well, making up the rest of the FBS. So all of the group of five MAC type schools, AAC type schools. Yeah, all the mid-majors that would make up the rest of the 130 plus FBS schools would be put into this 10-team pod that would face relegation and promotion from the full bottom of the tier of the college football landscape, which would just be the rest of the FBS outside of the top, the 10 schools they would fight for, I would guess they didn't lay out the exact amount of teams that would get relegated or promoted, but I get, I'm guessing it would be three, like similar to European soccer, which is there's three teams. There's usually, I think it's three or four teams, but four would be seem a little drastic. Three teams seems like a good sweet spot to relegate down or relic or promote up out of the rest of the FBS, and then it would be a no playoff committee. You don't have to worry about bias or judgment or anything like that. It would just be pure record, pure tiebreakers to set up a 16-team playoff. The top eight teams from the 80 total, the teams, each team that wins the one, the 10-team pod would get the first seed in that team, in that in that overall region, and they would go down to the second place team to get the wild cards team. So. For example, like in the Big East, for example, the Bearcats would be slotted there. 
and they actually ran this simulation today to see like what it would look like if an 80 team eight division super league would have looked the athletic did sam con jr of the athletic ran it today so cincinnati would be would have been in the big east they would have finished last in the big east last year obviously three and nine overall louisville would have been the number one seed in the big east and they would have gotten the top seed and then it just goes by tiebreaker with overall record for the rest of the wild cards, Neil. So it's not guaranteed that you're going to get two entries for each potting of teams. It The wild cards are just broken down by best record and tiebreakers throughout the rest of the division. So I love this. It would create a 16-team playoff. You'd have a first round, quarterfinals, semifinals, and then a overall national championship. And they kind of projected through it and had Michigan – over Texas in the national championship if it played out um, with this kind of model last year. They got to do something, Neil. This is a great, great option. People, I'm not doing an awesome job of breaking this down because it's like all written and it's easier to look at and read and kind of visually see it than it is to explain it over an auditory medium here. But it would have collective bargaining for NIL. They would be able to negotiate with a union that the players would be made up of. This would be college football completely separate from the rest of the NCAA, the rest of the college sports landscape, and then everything else, college basketball stays the same. All the other college sports stay the same under a normal conference structure. This seems like the best way to fix these these problems, Neil. This is a no-brainer decision to me, but the biggest hang-up is going to be the TV deals, and it's going to be those TV networks. Why on earth would ESPN, CBS, Fox Sports, all, whoever's buying these TV rights want to pay extra top dollar for a product that they're already shelling out a ton of money for and they're already getting big ratings returns on anyways. They don't care about the health of college football in terms of how difficult it is for a coach to retain his roster. They just want eyes on the sport. And there's never been more eyes on the sport than there have been right now in terms of the last 10 years. College football is the number two sport in America behind the NFL. There's not really any big reason for the TV networks to want to change things right now. And they would have to break up those TV deals and probably pay way more for the combined college football entity as a TV product. It's a tough sell, Neil, but I love what this is with this group, college sports, uh, college sports. What is it called? The, I keep forgetting this name. College sports tomorrow is laying out 20 person group that people are claiming is trying to buy college football, but it needs to be bought and it needs to be reshaped and it needs a new structure. Yeah, personally, Russ, I, I love this idea as well. I think it definitely can provide, a, a, a better format for the college football playoffs, but B, a more interesting thing, a twist of things in the college football playoff landscape. But as you mentioned, I think if it was something that could potentially be feasible to do, I think the only outlier of this, as you mentioned, would be the TV deals, obviously. A lot of people know the TV deals just currently got restructured not too long ago, but I think the only thing that would hold this hold this opportunity back would be the TV deals. But overall, I, I Russ, I'm all in for this. I'm all in for this. I'm all in for it. I haven't talked to anybody yet. I don't know anybody who would be shooting it down, especially Bearcats fans, knowing that they would be in the big kids club. You're never getting like, – and I should also mention the 70 teams that are all power conference schools plus Notre Dame and SMU never get relegated. You're always in the top tier, always fighting for a chance to win a national championship. The money is going to keep this from happening anytime soon, I'm sure. But the fact that this, like the athletics reporting on this, these big heavy hitters are involved with this. People know there's an issue. We got to get it solved and we'll see how quickly the sport can solve it. If they ever do solve it here in the 2020s and 2030s and beyond. For Neil Meyer, I'm Russ Elton. This has been Bearcat Blitz on the Believe Network. This is the second. 15 seconds left. Shot clock off. Four point game. DeJulius puts up a three. Yeah!